Hi everybody. Um, obviously I'm a little bit nervous and I will certainly cope with that very quickly. Uh, when I start talking about my favorite subject, uh, I will be talking about how the brain adapts to new experience. And that's something that we've been through all our life and we will be through all our life. Our brain is a machine that is connected, highly wired, and something that is common to all humans. We all connected the same way, but our brain functions differently because the communication between these cells are very different. So I'm coming from a university uh, where I'm studying and teaching. I'm studying Alzheimer's disease mostly. And when you're studying Alzheimer's disease, you need to know what is the main trouble of Alzheimer's disease. You need to know how memory is formed in the brain. And the idea was to understand how, in physiological condition, where there is no trouble, why people are making memories and how they're making memories. And then from there, we can extrapolate to pathology and to see how and why this memory is not functional anymore in Alzheimer's disease patients. We learn a lot from... Uh, next. Sorry. We learn a lot from the brain by understanding that we are whole... The, the brain is a whole wired structure. The, the neurons have a meanings just because they're connected to each other. So just like Stephen Hawking said, our brain is a giant internet. It's basically cells that are communicating to each other. And this communication is what they are here for. So we learn a lot from the brain by understanding its structure. And we can do that at different level. At the level of the whole organ, what we call the, the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. We can see that very well with the new imaging tools. You can see the brain, you can see its anatomy, but you can also see it functioning. And that's something that helps us to understand what's going on when memories are forming. Then you can go to a lower scale, what we call normal network. That's this interconnection between the neurons. Part of the brain are changing in information all the time. Uh, even when you're sleeping, your brain is working. It's sending information from one part to another part. And this is possible because there is networks. There is interaction, exchange of information. And if you go even to a smaller scale, we end up with synapses. Synapses, that's this little weird things that I draw here. Uh, it's a little, well, we say it, it's, it looks like a mushroom. In front of this mushroom, there will be another connecting neurons. And the one that you see with the little green bubbles here, that's a, a neuron coming and sending information to the other one. The other one will be able to read that message and to send the information to another neuron. So neurons are the noble cells present in your brain. That's the unit that forms the central nervous system and forms the nervous system in all your body. You've got neurons everywhere. Your uh, guts are full of neurons, but your brain, obviously, that's where there are a lot of neurons interconnected to each other. Actually, there's neurons, but there's plenty of other cells, and the neurons are not the majority of the cells in the CNS in the central nervous system. But you can see that we got neurons with very different shapes. And they are all over your brain. And these shapes are so different because they have very different function. Some of them look like, a, what we say, bipolar cells, receiving information, sending information on the other one. The one on the bottom here is look like a, three really, is receiving a lot of information and he has to synthesize them to send only one type of information. So these cells are very morphologically um, typical and this morphology is linked to the function. Everybody here in the room has this neuron with this specific shapes and they are all interconnected to 
their target cells. All the neurons, and that's something that is common to the human species, will be connected in the same way. One neuron from your cortex will be sending information to other part of the brain, and this will be done through connections that you see here. This button that you see with the synaptic vesicles, that's where the transmission of the information will be done. And just beneath that, there will be a reading plate. It, it's something like a key and um, a key getting into a lock. When it's opening something, the information is coming. This is a chemical that will be released to transfer the information to the other neuron. And this Chemical informations are very important. They give a very important flexibility in modulating the, the message that has been sent. If we are looking to flies, for example, there will be electrical synapses. They will be touching each other like a wire, like an electric wire. It's very efficient, but it's very difficult to modulate that sort of signal. Here, in the human body, in the most sophisticated species, let's say it this way, there is this neurochemical uh, neurotransmission. So brain plasticity is the ability of the brain to be reorganized in neural pathway based on new experience. That sounds very difficult to understand maybe, but it's not really. I mean, you've all been experiencing that in your life by being trained, by doing things that you learn how to do, and your brain has been changed by that. Today, your brain has been changed by your experience you're living right now. And everything that I learned from every topics that we've been talking about, that's what your brain has been changed, it's been changed, and this is because of uh, neuroplasticity. So let's look at the neuron in a newborn baby, and then you see the different age, the same images of the cortex of this baby. Well, you can see that at the beginning, from the left, there is exactly the same number of cells, the same number of neurons in that structure. What makes the difference in the evolution and the ability that you're gaining when you're aging, this is just the way the connection between the neurons will be denser. So by increasing the density of the contact of the synapse, improving the communication, that's how we learn. And our brain is not gaining new cells, it's just gaining new connections. And this is something that will be through your whole life. Obviously, it will be more obvious when you're young, but it will still be able, at whatever age we are talking about. One of the key, well, easy feature that tells you that there is a flexibility, a plasticity of your brain, is this little girl, for example. She has some high defects. She cannot see very well. She cannot see depth, can see detail very well, because there's a lack of connection between the eye, the retina, and the cortical, well, the, the the occipital cortex, where there should be connection. There should, here, in this case, the connections are too poor to give the best that the eye could give. So one of the ways of treating that sort of very uh, benign uh, disease is to close the eyes that is functioning perfectly to make the other one work better and, and stronger for a long period of time, for well, a few weeks, and then they will reconnect and create new communication, and she will regain the sight, the normal sight that you're expecting from uh, a young uh, human being like this. So what's occurring when your brain is developing? First, the cells are well, migrating into the brain, and these normal cells will slightly start to differentiate create the pathway, well, they will follow a pathway and make connection with other neurons. And as you can see in the different way of, of communicating, the cell will start to make connection with all different cells. Then they will be refining this communication, maintaining only the strong communication. And then, little by little, they will make intense communication through the synapses. This is 
these synapses that will make the brain really efficient and will make the brain different from one individual to another one. The experience will shape your brain and make this connection uh, functional. So if you were counting the neurons in a the brain, there is hundred billions of neurons in an adult brain. But if you're taking a cubic centimeter of this adult brain, you will get pretty much the same number of synapses. So there is an enormous number of synapses. And these numbers are in perpetual change. They will be removed, they will, be get, they will get stronger, depending on the experience. And when you're a teenager, that's a very major event that will arrive. And you will be losing synapses, creating synapses very quickly. And that might be explaining the change of character of the teenagers. That's why they have their mood, they can switch from one extreme to another one. That's the synapse formation that explains that. In an adult brain, when you're learning things, well, that will change also the weight, we said the weight of the connection. They will become more efficient. Do you know that your whole body is drawn in your brain and all the, the sensitive connection Oh, you, you can have a map of your body on your sensitive cortex. If somebody is learning how to play guitar, he will get the new skills, new ways of moving his fingers, and the representation of his hand and finger in the brain will become bigger. It will not become bigger because there is more neurons involved. It will become bigger because there will be more synapses, new synapses that will explain how this brown territory that you see on both sides are getting bigger. So your brain is evolving on a continuous uh, feature and is evolving depending on your experience. This brain plasticity is extremely important for new memory formations. So synaptic plasticity is the ability of synapses to strengthen or weaken over time in response of the increase and decrease of the activity. Two neurons, because you're humans, two of your neurons are connected the same way, but the connection and the interaction between these neurons are very different depending on your own experience. The synapses will be dense or will be very weak depending on what you like and what you've been learning and what you are doing on a daily basis. For memory, well, we found out that there was some place that was very important to well, for, to create new memories. This place is called the hippocampus. You see it, that's the one with all the arrows pointing at. This hippocampus is a, a very small structure at the base of the brain, and it's been studied for a certain period of time now, uh, because we are sure that to create new memories, you need that structure. That structure has been removed on a patient that was suffering from epilepsy. When you have epilepsy, there is some, well, we say that part of the brain becomes overactive and send this information, this crazy information, all over the brain. And sometimes you can cure it with a pharmacological compound, a medicine, and sometimes you can't. And this patient, called HM patient, is very famous because the surgeon had the good idea at the time to remove the place where epilepsy was generated in his brain, and his place was the hippocampus. When they removed that, this patient was unable to create new memories. And actually, you can see that there is, uh, on YouTube, there is interview of this patient because it's so famous. All the neurosurgeons were really surprised by the consequence of removing that tiny part of the brain. Usually, they're removing larger part, and it doesn't affect memory that much. Here, this patient could remember all souvenirs, but he was unable to create new memories. So we understood from there that there was something special about this little brain structure. So obviously, people start to look closer to this structure. And one of the 
interesting experiment that has been done was made by some of our British colleagues uh, not very long time ago, in 2000. They looked at the anatomy of this structure in taxi drivers, and they found out that this little red spot that you see here was getting bigger as the taxi driver were doing their job for a long period of time. So the longer they were trying to find the right place in London, the bigger was this hippocampus. So it seems that there was a clear correlation between our ability to generate and to well, move around a new environment and the size of the hippocampus. When they were retiring, well, this structure is somehow shrinking. So there's something strange going into this structure. So now we're going to the lower level. So we went from brain anatomy, and now we're talking about the network anatomy of this structure. So it's called the hippocampus because it has this round shape like the hippocampus, uh, the fish, I guess. Um, and this hippocampus has very structured neurons interconnected to each other. And some of the people studying the networks are what we call electrophysiologists. The electrophysiologist has this ability to monitor really little level of electricity in the brain. They can record the electric message sent from one neuron to another one by these little uh, pin-like uh, glass electrodes that they will uh, insert into the cell body of the neurons. And they can monitor what you're seeing here on the size. You see, there is this, they, they stimulate the pathway, the communication between the neurons that are located in CA1, so that is the top one, they stimulate a single response. So they were doing a very repeated single response, and the, the answer was always the same. It's 0 0.1. So they were stimulating with a very low frequency. And then some guy had the idea to do high frequency stimulation. When they did that, they had an enhanced response that you can see. You see the tetanus, that is high frequency stimulation. And then what they saw that the single stimulation that they were doing was generating a response that was twice the size of the previous response, and this for a long period of time. We were very excited about that. I, I know it's difficult to, <laughs> to think about it, but this is the, electro, the electrical trace of memory. This, by a very dense and short experience, drive the brain to change the way the communication between two neurons. What used to give 100% response is just giving the double. And this is what we are expecting from MRA, something that will be enhanced and will be prolonged for a long period of time. This discovery made a, a, an article that is the most cited article in the neuroscience field. Everybody just loved this model. And we think what's going on and what could explain that is actually that at the synapse level, so we're going down to the level of the interaction between these two neurons. So on one side, you've got the normal synapses before what we call the long-term potentiation, before the memory formation, you seeing, well, the neuron will release neurotransmitter that will activate the communication to the other neuron. When this neuron has been exposed to a very large and intense stimulation, they will change their shape. The synapses become bigger. They become bigger, they increase the number of the structure that can read the change in neurotransmitters. So what used to give you a normal response will double this response. And this is the memory at the synaptic level. From this normal size synapse, we will go to a big size synapse, and from there they will evolve to two synapses. So where there was only one synapse, now you got two. So at the scale of the brain, the, the structure will get bigger and bigger. And that's how the brain responds to that. We did some experiments in my lab. So what you're seeing here is the synapses. So we, we make the neuron fluorescent. 
I will tell you how we do that. But what you see, all the different spots that you have here, they are synapses. And the change in fluorescence level tells you that when we activate the neurotransmission, we can see the modulation, the change in shape, and the change in response that we're generating from other neurons that you don't see because they're not fluorescent, but they are just sending information to these neurons. So we've got something that is really, that we can model in a dish of culture, and we can study memory in dish. So when you're talking about memory, that's the physiological aspects of memory, um, you have to look at what the disease that affect the most the memory will be doing to this process. So I'm going to be talking about Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is something, I mean, this is the first cause of dementia in the world. Uh, there is no treatment. And we know that there's a lot of people that are suffering from this disease. We also know that there will be even more people because one of the major uh, factors that influence the prevalence of the disease is aging. And we know that we're all aging, and though the industrial population are aging a lot. So if you look at the money that will be necessary for treating this disease, well, there's going to be an expanded money because the number of cases will be going up. And as you can see here from 2010 to 2050, there will be more and more people suffering from this disease. And just because the population is aging. So we will need to find a cure because right now we are not curing people. We just try to reduce the symptoms, but we don't know how to regenerate the brain. And it's something that is very difficult to do. But if you look at the history of Alzheimer's disease, well, it was discovered in 1906 by this guy, Alois Alzheimer's. That wasn't a very successful doctor for a while. Uh, he didn't have a permanent position as a neuropathologist, and his wife, that was very rich, supported him most of the time. But he did find something that changed the way we, we see this disease now. He described the first case of a woman that was first suffering from, well, this clinical characteristic of Alzheimer's disease, memory loss, agnosia, and apraxia. So that means she wasn't able to recognize people that she used to recognize. Apraxia, so that means she cannot use the tools that she knew how to use before, a toothbrush, a fork. And she had abnormal behavior. And the anosognosia means that she wasn't aware that she was sick. So you had really the characteristic clinical feature of someone that just doesn't know she's sick and doesn't have the ability to generate new memories. What he has found is if you look closely to the brain, and here you've got two brain of what we call a control patient, so the one that doesn't have the disease, and on the other side, a patient that will suffer from Alzheimer's disease. What you see, what is striking, is the side of the brain. This is what we call a neurodegenerative disease. The brain is degenerated. It's getting smaller, and you see, for example, the ventricles that you see in the middle of the brain is getting much larger because well, you know, nature likes to fill up the, the empty space, so they will become bigger, and that means that we are losing neurons, a lot of neurons. And if you look inside the parenchyma of the brain, inside the tissue, you will find this weird little thing called senile plaques. These senile plaques are actually, well, they've been extracted, and people found that they were composed of a tiny, little peptide, 42 uh, amino acids. And these 42 amino acids actually comes from this very large transmembrane protein. So here in pink, I guess, uh, you see this transmembrane protein with a large part that is outside the cells. And the green part, that's this little peptide that we see in signal plaques. So in the brain, you hold bearing this kind of, trans uh, this trans uh, of transmembrane protein, and they will be cut by enzymes. 
and that's the physiological role of this protein. They'll be cut, and the beta amyloid peptide will be released. And when they will be released, well, if you are doing okay, we don't really know what is going on. We think it's clearing out the brain, especially when you're sleeping. When you are overproducing this peptide, they will start to auto-aggregate and make these plaques in the brain. That means you're sick. So when the people found out that in cellular plaques there was a lot of this amyloid beta peptide, well, they had the idea to look at these plaques and what it was doing to neurons. And these plaques have the ability to kill the neurons. There is no neurons where there is plaques. But it's not really what we think is important in the disease. And you see, it's from 1983. People start to play around with this peptide. And they found out that, yeah, when it's in plaque formation, it can kill neurons. But now people are saying, well, maybe before that they are making plaques, maybe they are disrupting synaptic plasticity in the brain. Once again, I'm back to my very exciting trace of the memory. You think, you remember, so the 100% response, then this high-frequency stimulation, and this very important response, twice the amount that you, had, you get usually. In, in blue, well, people have put on the slice form of the peptide that were not aggregated with a soluble form of A-beta, and they found out that they couldn't do this LTP, this potentiation, on the long term. So that means you are disrupting the electrical trace of memory. So there was a really key new discovery here, and it was in 2000, well, 2000 there yeah, one, I think, uh, that showed that maybe memory was disrupted by this peptide. It wasn't that the neurons were killed by this peptide, but that this peptide is actually playing with synaptic plasticity. So what's going on in the brain from this synaptotoxicity? That's what we call when you are playing around with the synapse, making them unable to sustain new memory, to the end of the game where your brain has been losing too much neurons to be cured. That's basically what we try to understand in my lab to work with my uh, students. And the problem with Alzheimer's disease, it's a disease that never really happened in animals. And usually animals, when they're aging, they're getting weaker and they die very quickly because they've got predators and because they cannot stay weak in a wild environment. Obviously, when you're keeping in zoo, for example, well, we start to see animals that have weird behavior. But still, there is no real model to mimic what's going on in the brain to see Alzheimer's disease. So what the researcher did, they did something not very nice that is called humanized mice. When we say humanized mice, that means we are making genetic change in the brain of these mice to express human proteins. And in this case, we make them express this transmembrane protein that gives the amyloid beta peptide. And we choose certain form of this trans, uh, transmembrane protein with mutation. This mutation, when they've been identified in humans, they give 100% the case uh, the Alzheimer's disease of the person. And they give a very um, intense form. A very young people will develop the disease, but that's the same disease that most of the people are developing. It's just faster and more aggressive. So when we introduce into the brain of these mice this um, peptide, with, well, this transmembrane protein with this mutation, we can look at the brain and see the early stage of the disease. And here what you see is the electron microscopy of the brain tissue of these mice. It's not very easy to see, but all these different little stars, the red stars that you see on the tissue, that's where the synapses are. And we're looking in the hippocampus, obviously. And if you look on the mice that are overexpressing this transmembrane protein, we see that there is little stars and there's a lot of stars missing. So we are pretty sure that in the early stage of the disease, your brain 
is losing synapses. The contacts are not so rich anymore. Obviously, that's something that you can see in human, but well, we cannot kill people to look what's in the, inside our brain before they got the disease, really. So uh, we don't have a lot of cases of people that die young with a suspicion of Alzheimer's disease. So we are working on this transmembrane protein, try to understand its function, and we are especially working on certain mutations that has been identified in humans. We are working on different type of mutation, the Osaka mutation, the Icelandic mutation, and the Swedish mutation. These are all tiny mutations in the structure of the peptide. You're seeing in the different, in the sequence of this transmembrane peptide on the bottom, you're seeing what amino acid has changed in this sequence. And it, usually it's one amino acid that is changed. So you've got the same peptide with only one amino acids change. And in this case, what you see when you've got the other expression of this transmembrane uh, protein, well, you've got very different type of Alzheimer's disease. The worst is the Swedish mutation. The Swedish mutation is just producing a lot of peptide. But the mutation is actually outside the sequence of the peptide. It's just promoting more secretion of this peptide. We found the Osaka mutation very interesting. So it's in Japanese pedigree. In this Japanese pedigree, they found out that there was one amino acid missing in the sequence in 22 position. When they are missing one amino acid, this peptide is not released by the neuron. It stays inside the neurons. The other one is the one that I like the most, is the Icelandic mutation. The Icelandic mutation has been found in, uh, in 2010 by people in Iceland. And they found that people that were bearing this mutation, they never have Alzheimer's disease. Even that, they have a better cognitive aging. They are just very lucky. So when we check what this mutation was doing to our cells, we check whether they were producing, releasing this peptide, or they were keeping inside like we were expecting from the Osaka mutation. And what you can see with this little cross in front of them, we have exactly what we were expected. For the human APP, what we call APP, so the transmembrane protein, we're seeing somehow a release in the supernatant. So we're doing this in, in cell culture. We have a release of peptide, but a lot of peptides also stay inside the cells. With the Osaka mutation, they only stay inside the cells. With the Icelandic, basically it's doing what the peptide is doing with the wild type formation. It's released and stay inside. And for the Swedish, it's releasing an enormous amount of this peptide outside the cells, but it has some also inside. So with that mutation, what we wanted to show is whether we could understand what this peptide was doing to the synapses. Is this necessary to be secreted? Can it be toxic to the synapses by staying inside? And is the Icelandic mutation not doing what we're expecting to see on these uh, synapses? So we had the perfect match here with all these different mutations to understand what is this peptide doing to the cells. Then we had to observe them. Well, the, the good thing about uh, cell culture, you can grow them into a dish, but they are very difficult to see. You need a good microscope, and what really changed the, the life of the biologists in general and neurobiologists is the discovery from this uh, Japanese researcher. It was an old guy that received the Nobel Prize when he was 80 for studying algae. He had found lots of algaes that were fluorescent. And he could clone the sequence that give you fluorescence. At the beginning, nobody really cared. But now, the revolution for us is that we can put this little sequence of fluorescent protein and to uh, fuse them with our protein of interest. Now we've got green protein, We've got red protein, and you've got all the different colors of the rainbow, really. 
And that means that with that fluorescence, you can follow in live cells what is going on with these proteins. So we used that trick to see all the different forms of IPP, where they were going and what they were, how they were influencing the structure of the neurons. This is one neuron that has been modified and is expressing this green protein. This green protein is very interesting. It's from a, it's a little tiny peptide with this fluorescent protein, and it has the ability to interact with actin. Actin is what we call the cytoskeleton. That's what gives the shape of the synapses. So what you see here, all these little tiny spots, they are synapses. Here you're seeing only one neuron, but there is plenty of them around them that are not fluorescent. So there is all connection, all these points are connected to other neurons, but the only one that we see is the one that is expressing this fluorescent protein. So we can look at them, we can study them, we can study them uh, in live neurons and to see how they are affected when they will be producing this peptide that we think is important for the Alzheimer's disease. So this is exactly how these synapses look like. They can be really thin, like we said philopodia, they're making little spaghetti, or they can have a little head on the book, so that's the thin one, then they're making the, what we call the stubby synapses, and the one that are more mature, that's the mushroom. So if you got mushroom in your brain, that's better than the other ones. And we can really count them, and, and we know, and it's very stable from one neuron. And when a neuron is functional, about, I would say, 60% of your synapses are in, mu in mushroom shapes. So that means that the neuron will be very efficient. So now we had to make this neuron sick. For this purpose, we use the, the transmembrane protein, APP, the one that contained the amyloid beta peptide inside, and we tag this protein with a red fluorescent protein. So all the red spots that you're seeing is this transmembrane protein. So here, we've got a neuron that is sick, that is, uh, well, is transfected with the human form of this transmembrane protein, and we can look at the synapses after 40 ways, 48 hours of transfection. And this neuron that is sick, what you can see here, this, the, the shape of the synapses has evolved already. And as you remember, uh, basically is the mushroom shape synapses that seems to disappear first. The other one, the mature one, stay pretty much the same, and we got overall pretty much the same number of, uh, of synapses, but really that's the more mature one that seems to disappear. So that's with the non-mutated forms of the amyloid beta peptide. If we look to the Osaka mutation, this Japanese pedigree. So this one, the peptide won't be released. It will stay inside the cells. And when you look at that, and we were looking with my student, and I said, well, there's something wrong. There is no synapses, pretty much. They all disappear, and they all become extremely immature. And they all have this very strange organization. And this mutation really changed the pathogenicity of this peptide. This peptide is not really sustained inside, and it becomes even more synaptotoxic than the other forms. The good one, the Icelandic mutation, make these weird things. Here we have the mutation, and we have the expression, because our neurons were red, but in this case, the synapses look the same. And when we count these synapses, they were, for most of them, in this mushroom shape and unaffected by the presence of this peptide with this tiny mutation, one amino acid. I mean, that's nothing for 42 amino acid peptide. And then the bad one, the Swedish uh, mutation. 
this one is just secreting a lot of peptide, but also producing some inside the neurons. And here, as you can see on the branch here, there is few synapses. And we are surprised because they are big. They are abnormally big. But if you look at their shape, they are very strange. I mean, they are very well, uh, very uh, weirdly structured. When we count them, you can see there is a very large reduction of this mushroom type of synapse. So all together, when we put all these different experiments, that's what we see. The more toxic or the more severe form of the disease will generate a very high loss of synapses, and the more mature one will be the one that are most affected. The ICE mutation, this mutation that preserves people from Alzheimer's disease, this ICE mutation is just sparing the synapses. And if you look at the different type of synapses, it's mostly the more mature one, the, the, the mushroom type, that will be affected by this mutation. And that's what we see here. So what we can say about it is, obviously, this peptide is secreted outside the cells. But maybe the synapses are affected by this peptide because for the first stage, before it's released, it stays inside the cells. So the enemy is inside the neuron and is affecting the maturity of the synapse. This means that you will be unable to generate normal memories. So there's something about this peptide that tells you that it is in the center of the disease. And some people had the idea to develop a compound that were able to block the processing of this transmembrane protein and to block the secretion of this amyloid peptide. When you use that, and this is what we call the beta secretase inhibitor, but that's basically a compound that has been tested in humans now. When you do that, you can totally reverse the influence, the negative influence of this different peptide, the Osaka peptide, you're seeing on the top the one without this inhibitor, and on the bottom one, the one that's been treated during the 48 hours where we make this uh, pathological model. And you see, we're just recovering everything. And the Swedish one, the one that was making everything disappear, pretty much, also is reversed by this inhibitor. So this inhibitor has the ability to block the loss of synapses. That's a great hope for the future, if we can apply that to humans. And actually, people have been working on that. This is what we see. So a neuron in the early stage of the disease will lose synapses. And that's why they are unable to generate new memories. And if we're using this beta secretase inhibitor, this uh, pharmacological compound to block the production of this peptide, well, we can rescue the cells and make them resistant to Alzheimer's disease. So as I said, this has been tested in humans, and the result wasn't very promising, very, very good. Um, but we think we understood why. Um, you know, when you want to treat people, and most of the time, we have problem to find the right people to treat. Well, we say everybody that is suffering from the disease should be treated. But when the symptoms are so obvious, I mean, the destruction in the brain is going too far, and you can go back. So this compound is certainly a hope for the future. If we are able to detect people that will get the disease, that are suffering to the very mild form of the disease, the problem is, you know, we, we know how to detect that. The first symptoms are memory troubles. But some of the people, let's say 50% of them, don't evolve to a severe form of the disease. Some other people will have Alzheimer's disease. If we are treating these people that will never, never develop the disease itself by a compound that has certainly side effect, well, is this acceptable? That's a question that we have to answer in the future. Do we want to treat people that won't have Alzheimer's disease? 
And that's definitely something that we have to think about and to find the right decision. Just to tell you, this is where I work, and there is a mountain on the other side, so just like the mountain that you have over there. Um, it's a very nice place, skiing resorts, and students love it. There's a lot of students that did this job with me. Uh, so, I mean, you know, the European community is giving a lot of opportunity for the students to move to one university to another. Think about it. Uh, we teaching in English. I'm making some ads here. Thank you very much.